The Origins of Sabi The word Sabi means, patina, antique look, elegant simplicity. The same character can also translate as, tranquility. The adjective Sabishii means, lonely, lonesome, or, solitary. There also exists a verb, Sabaru, with a different logograph, but the same reading. It means to rust, decay or show signs of age, adding another layer of flavor. Over time, the word sabi has come to communicate a deep and tranquil beauty that emerges with the passage of time. Visually, we recognize this as the patina of age, weathering, tarnishing and signs of antiquity. Sabi is a condition created by time, not the human hand, although it often emerges on quality objects that were originally crafted with care. It is interested in the refined elegance of age. It is beauty revealed in the processes of use and decay, such as the dull shine and the worn grain of a well-loved farmhouse kitchen table. In his thought-provoking classic, In Praise of Shadows, celebrated author Junichiro Tanizaki noted how Japanese people find beauty in sabi saying, We do not dislike everything that shines, but we do prefer a pensive luster to a shallow brilliance. A murky light that, whether in a stone or an artifact, bespeaks a sheen of antiquity. We do love things that bear the marks of grime, soot, and weather, and we love the colors and the sheen that call to mind the past that made them. Although Sabi is concerned with how the passage of time manifests itself physically in objects, as with so much of Japanese aesthetics, its deeper meaning hints at what is hidden beneath the surface of the actual item that we see. It is a representation of the way all things evolve and perish and can evoke an emotional response in us, often tinged with sadness, as we reflect on the evanescence of life. Sabi beauty reminds us of our own connection. The birth of Wabi Sabi. It is a Wabi heart that recognizes Sabi beauty, and the two have gone hand in hand for many generations. The essence of their teaching stretches back through the centuries, but the conjoined term wabi-sabi has only emerged as a recognized term within the past hundred years or so, as a result of a desire to understand what lies beneath the psychology of Japanese people. A label was needed for what people had always known. Wabi-sabi simultaneously lives on the edge of people's consciousness and deep in their hearts. My friend Setsuko, now in her seventies, said she had never uttered wabi-sabi out loud until I asked her about it, even though it is part of the essence of who she is, and she has an immediate sense of what it means to her. Wabi-sabi goes beyond the beauty of any given object or environment, to refer to one's response to that profound beauty. Wabi-sabi is a feeling, and it is intangible. One person's wabi-sabi is not the same as another's, because each of us experiences the world in different ways. We feel wabi-sabi when we come into contact with the essence of authentic beauty, the kind that is unpretentious, imperfect, and all the better for that. This feeling is prompted by a natural beauty, that which is austere and unadorned. The closest term we have for this response in the English language is, aesthetic arrest, as hinted at by James Joyce in his novel A Portrait of the Artist as a young man Joyce wrote, with the past, of the natural cycle of life and of our very own. Mortality the instant wherein that supreme quality of beauty, the clear radiance of the aesthetic image, is apprehended luminously by the mind which has been arrested by its wholeness and fascinated by its harmony is the luminous silent stasis of aesthetic pleasure, a spiritual state very like to that cardiac condition which the Italian physiologist Luigi Galvani called the enchantment of the heart. But even this is just talking about the physical response, and not the deeper philosophy of wabi-sabi, which relates to the nature of life itself. Life Lessons Inspired by Wabi-sabi Wabi-sabi is deeply connected to the kind of beauty which reminds us of the transient nature of life. This stems from the three Buddhist marks of existence, mujo, impermanence, ku, suffering, and ku, no individual self, a oneness with all things. The life lessons Wabi Sabi can teach us, and which we will explore in this book, are rooted in the following ideas, the world looks very different when you learn to see and experience it from your heart. All things, including life itself, are impermanent, incomplete and imperfect. Therefore, 
Perfection is impossible, and imperfection is the natural state of everything, including ourselves. There is great beauty, value, and comfort to be found in simplicity. Still, wabi-sabi is not a panacea. It's a reminder that stillness, simplicity, and beauty can help us fully inhabit a moment in the middle of anything, and that's a lesson for all of us. A gift for us all. Not long ago, I watched a pair of Japanese high school students give a presentation on wabi-sabi in the USA. At the end, one of the Americans in the audience asked, Do you think anyone can learn wabi-sabi? The girls looked at each other, brows crinkled, panicked and unsure. After much deliberation, one of them responded, No. We feel it because we are Japanese. Wabi-sabi invites us to be present to beauty with open eyes and an open heart. I disagree. Wabi-sabi is a deeply human response to beauty which I believe we all have the capacity to experience, if only we better attune ourselves to it. My perspective on wabi-sabi will always be in the context of my own worldview, which is based in a Western upbringing, heavily influenced by a 20-year love affair with Japan. Your perspective will differ from mine and, if you have the opportunity to talk to a Japanese person about it, their perspective will be different again. But therein lies the beauty, and largely the point, it is in taking inspiration from other cultures and interpreting it in the context of our own lives that we excavate the wisdom we most need. How is wabi-sabi relevant today? We are living in a time of brain-hacking algorithms, pop-up propaganda and information everywhere. From the moment we wake up, to the time we stumble into bed, we are fed messages about what we should look like, where, eat and buy, how much we should be earning, who we should love and how we should parent. Many of us probably spend more time thinking about other people's lives than investing in our own. Add to this the pace at which we are encouraged to function, and it's no wonder so many of us are feeling overwhelmed, insecure, untethered and worn out. What's more, we are surrounded by bright, artificial light, in our homes, shops and offices, on our phones and laptops. We are overstimulated and obsessed with productivity. It's playing havoc with our nervous systems and ability to sleep. We are paying the price of having banished the calming shadows and rich texture from our lives, in favor of speed and efficiency. Our eyes and hearts are weary. We give away freely that most precious of resources, our attention, and in doing so, we cheat ourselves out of the gifts that are already here. While powerful and valuable in many ways, social media is turning us into comparison addicts and validation junkies. We interrupt precious life moments to take a picture and post it, then spend the next hour checking how much approval we have received from people we hardly even know. Any time we have a spare minute, out comes the phone and down go the eyes, as we scroll our way into someone else's highly styled life, the jealousy bubbling, as we make the assumption that they actually live like that. Every time we do this, we miss unknowable opportunities for connection, serendipity and everyday adventure in our own lives, for the mind has gone somewhere the body cannot follow. Many of us can't make a move without stressing about what others will think. We sit in line waiting for permission from somebody else, all the while worrying about things that haven't yet happened. We tell ourselves stories about our limits, downplaying where we measure up and overplaying where we fall down. When we dare to imagine following our dreams, we are surrounded by so many manicured images of success we start wondering whether there's any room left for us. Countless broken dreams lie scattered across the world for no reason other than someone compared themselves to someone else and thought, I am not good enough. The upshot of this crisis of confidence is, at best, inertia. Somewhere along the line, someone started a rumor that happiness lies in the accumulation of things, money, power and status, all the while looking young, pretty and skinny, or young, handsome and strong. But when we measure our lives with other people's yardsticks, opening ourselves up to the tyranny of should, we put ourselves under immense pressure to achieve, and do, and own stuff we don't really care about. This desire for more affects our behavior, our decision-making and the way we feel about ourselves, not to mention the impact on our planet. Whatever we have or become, it's not enough, 
or so we are led to believe. And here's the real irony. What we outwardly push for is often very different to what we inwardly long for. We have come to a point where we need to pause, take a look around and decide for ourselves what really matters. Wabi Sabi can help us do this, which makes this centuries-old teaching more relevant than ever today.